Hello, I'm Dan Costa. He is Max Eddy, and this is PC Mag Live. We've got a great show for you today. We're going to talk about the top tech news of the day. We're going to answer some reader questions and show you one cool thing. Max, let's get to the biggest story of the day. We talked last week about how the Sony PlayStation 4 was outselling the Xbox, but there were no numbers behind it. They were right. just Sony was just saying, yeah, it's twice as much as the Xbox One. We've got numbers now from NPD Group. Sony has sold 5.3 million PlayStation 4s since it launched. That's a pretty good success story. Absolutely, and it's up from, uh, I think it was a 2.2 million that it sold in the first two weeks, so it's seen 100% growth in about two months. It's very good, they're beating Xbox One. And I was talking to our uh, video game analyst, Jeff, and he was saying that the reason this is is because there's much more compelling launch titles for Xbox One than for PS4, but there's still or a lot of people... For PS4 than Xbox One. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Thank you for saying what I meant <laughs> to say. But uh, it, there's interesting things here, too, because people are buying the Sony products just because they've had good experiences that, with them in the past. People bought them like day one without any thought about what's going to be on there, making long-term long -term investments. I think we're not, we can't really call it case closed, obviously, but where it goes from here is anyone's guess. But also the price difference. I mean, they're coming in true. $100 cheaper than the Xbox. We thought that might be a problem. I always said that people were not going to change platforms. People are going to stick with the platform that they've got. They've invested a lot of time. They've bought games. That whole uh, legacy is going away. You're going to have to buy new games. Yeah. But I think people are going to stick with the, the platform that they started with. And don't forget that on uh, February 22nd, this system will be launching in Japan, which could be a total, total difference. Indeed. Also in the news, we've got news on the Galaxy S5, one of the most anticipated phones of the year. There's some details. We have the semi-confirmed rumor that the new Galaxy S5 will have, first it'll be announced this week at, MD at MWC, and second that it'll come with a fingerprint sensor, hopefully to rival the fingerprint sensor on the iPhone 5S, but it works a little bit differently. Yes, the Sim Mobile blog says that instead of just tapping your finger against it like you do on an iPhone 5S, you actually swipe your finger against a sensor and you've got to like swipe it just right and you have to have like the right kind of moisture on your hands. It, to me, it sounds an awful lot like that fingerprint sensor on your laptop that you don't use because it's yeah. a huge pain. If it, if it works just like that fingerprint sensor that we've had on laptops forever, this product will not succeed. And there's a good chance that it might not be fantastic. Samsung sort of has a reputation for just taking a million ideas, throwing them at the wall and seeing if it sticks like that. What is the thing where like, it always stays on when you look at it? Who uses that? They've been very successful with that strategy, but I think it points out this need. I, I like the idea of a fingerprint sensor on your phone because we need that authentication do. to log into not only your phone, but all of your online services. And that's what Apple did not include. They allowed it to uh, access your phone quicker. It's not really more secure in that way because you can just use a pin code to get in. It just ma makes for faster access and some level of security. But you could also also authenticate purchases. And Samsung is saying that with, well, Samsung is not saying, but Samobile is saying that you'll be able to log into websites with uh, your fingerprint as well. And that's really taking it to a whole other level. That is fantastic news, and I hope it's true, and I hope that Samsung executes it well. It'll put a uh, fire under everyone to step up their security game with biometrics. Indeed. Finally in the news, Candy Crush is poised to raise $500 million through Candy an IPO. Crush. Why, do the, why does the, the makers of Candy Crush, uh, King Digital Entertainment, need $500 million? I don't know because they made <laughs> $1.9 billion in revenue last year. It does not cost that much to make Candy Crush. This is kind of, I, I, I don't quite get this story of how much value they're ascribing to what is essentially just an addictive mobile game. Well, that's the interesting thing. One of the other numbers that came out, they said 93 million daily players for this single game. And that's where their money is coming from. Because on mobile uh, devices, there's so many more ways to make money. You don't just buy the game once and then that's it. There's in-game purchases, which are much cheaper than downloadable DLC for PC or console games. There's advertising money that can be made. Even if you're not seeing advertisements on your game, your information can be sent to third parties and they make money off that. It's like, uh, it's like Flappy Bird, that guy was making $50,000 a day. It doesn't matter whether or not the game is still in Just the Just think source. if you were running a website that had 93 million visitors every day. That would be a pretty successful website. That's a pretty valuable audience. I wish PCMag.com had that kind of audience. We have twice that audience. Just around there. I, I, the exact numbers uh, have not been confirmed yet. But anyway, so I'm sure we'll be hearing more about those numbers uh, when the IPO actually goes through. Let's move on to a reader question to now. We got this question in from Paula, and she's concerned about the latest Kickstarter breach. Seems like every week there's a new online company that has lost passwords and emails. Get used to it. And she wants to know, you know, what can, you know, does she, she has to change her password mm -hmm. now. What can she do to protect herself from 
which she really has no control over, which is websites losing her password information. And that's an important thing to point out, is that at the end of the day, there's not a lot that users can do to prevent information from being stolen. But you can protect yourself for when information is stolen, because it will happen. The best thing you can do is to use a long, complex, unique password for every single login. And that can be pretty ridiculous. We've seen studies that most people in the US have between 35 to 60 different logins, and almost everyone recycles their passwords, which is why we tell people to use password managers. These let you generate, store, and then input those passwords without you having to remember a thing. Well, usually just one password. We recommend LastPass. Um, it's a dollar a month if you want to use it on a mobile phone, but it's free if you just want to use it on as many computers as you like. It's a great piece of software. We've been really happy working with them. Yeah, I've been using it for years. And it's, it basically frees you from having to know your, your passwords. Like, you can't remember all of your passwords. No. You will not be able to. And if you can remember all your passwords, they are not strong passwords. Yeah, you're doing it wrong at that point. But it's important to point out, too, that you can actually log in with Facebook to Kickstarter. And uh, I was reading about this story earlier, and they all they had to do is reset those authentication tokens, and those Facebook people are totally fine. That's another thing to consider. But then, of course, Facebook becomes your point of failure. So six and one. Yeah, hopefully that's helpful, Paula. Let's move on to one cool thing. Every year, we test thousands of products here in our labs in New York City. Every day, we take one thing off the lab shelf and show it to you live on air. Today, that thing is the Toshiba Encore tablet. This is an eight inch tablet that's running Windows 8.1. And the amazing thing that I think about it is that it is 320, it's $329? $329. $329. So this is a very, very affordable system, but you get full Windows for that. Yeah, and it's not Windows RT, it's not a broken piece of crap, it's great. I haven't had a chance to use this yet, but I saw that our review is posting shortly, and it sounds like it's going to be pretty We can positive. go ahead and tell people the review isn't posted yet, but it's going to get four stars. Uh, we like it a lot. I mean, it's just a great all-around system. Eight, more than eight and a half hours of battery life, so it's, it's got your all-day computing power. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you get all of your Windows applications as well. It's a winner. <laughs> so it's a really nice tablet. Please read Brian Westover's full review on PCMag.com. That's PCMag Live for today. Remember to leave us questions in the comments section on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. We will answer them live on air. Tune in tomorrow for a brand new episode. See you.